Good morning and welcome to Southern Hills United Methodist Church on this crisp fall morning. We have a number of announcements for today and uh, I'd like to remind you that the pumpkin patch is going on and as you notice the uh, number of pumpkins is smaller than last week so that's a good thing but we still need help with uh, people manning the pumpkin patch to help sell the pumpkins. I'd also like to remind everyone that today after second service we're having our pumpkin patch tailgate party and there'll be prizes for the best tailgate food so we're encouraging you to stay over for second service for the tailgate party next sunday is going to be our fall festival and uh, so we appreciate everyone that comes and helps with all the programs that we do at the fall festival and of course we'll need prizes for uh, the different types of games and things that we have going on at the fall festival and the United Methodist men are again serving free hot dogs soda pops water and chips and we could certainly use donations of hot dog buns wieners uh, chips water soda whatever you can do for us and we need that by uh, Sunday morning of the 27th so that we know what else we need to go out and buy speaking of which we could also use cash donations I uh, also want to remind you that uh, Christmas is just around the corner and we're going to be needing some uh, presents for some needy families and uh, so we have a box out in the narthex and we'd certainly appreciate that. I uh, also want to remind everyone that on our Wednesday gathering we can always use volunteers to help set up and to take things down afterwards so please consider helping when you come to the gathering. And on Wednesday mornings, if you would like to meet Pastor Bo here at the church at 11 o'clock, they'll be serving meals to the homeless in the stockyards. And that's a, a vital ministry of this church now. So we appreciate everyone who helps with that as well. Taste and see that the Lord is good. God's are sweeter than honey. God keeps our feet from wandering down wrong paths. God's precepts make us wiser than those who are accounted wise. Let us worship the one who guides our lives. Let us worship the one who leads us into life.
Pray with me. God of discernment and truth, be with us in our time of worship. Open our minds to receive your wisdom. Open our hearts to accept your love. Open our spirits to embrace your ways. Be present with us as we seek your guidance that we may follow in your wisdom and truth. Amen. I'm going to ask you to remain standing, if you would, as we read the gospel message today. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Today's lesson comes out of the 13th chapter of the gospel according to Matthew, beginning with the 47th verse. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that people threw into the lake and gathered all kinds of fish. When it was full, they pulled it to the shore, where they sat down and put the good fish together into containers. But the bad fish they threw away. That's the way it will be at the end of the present age. The angels will go out and separate the evil people from the righteous people and will throw the evil ones into a burning furnace. People there will be weeping and grinding their teeth. Have you understood all these things, Jesus asked? They said to him, yes. Then he said to them, therefore, every legal expert who has been trained as a disciple for the kingdom of heaven is like the head of a household who brings old and new things out of their treasure chest. Jesus is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Well, I want to invite the kiddos to come on up and join me for the children's moment. Just come right on up here. That's okay. I'm glad you guys are here this morning. Wearing some good colors, I see. That's right. It was a good game. I, I, I saw this weekend that the, the schooner flipped over. Oh, my gosh. I was so glad that nobody was hurt. Yes. As soon as you can hear everybody gasp, right? As soon as that happened. Oh, my goodness. I'm glad they were okay. Well, I want to tell you this uh, story this morning about a dog named Balto. Have you ever heard of a dog named Balto? You may not have, because this story I'm going to tell you about, it happened a long time ago. So Balto was a sled dog. Do you know what a sled dog is? He pulls a sled, right? Way up north, and Balto lived most of his life in Alaska. So he was really far north, where there's a lot of snow. I went to Alaska one time on a mission trip, and it was so pretty. And there was snow everywhere, a lot of snow up there. So he lived a lot of his life up there. He was born in 1919. So he was born 100 years ago this year. Can you believe that? I don't know what day he was born on. I should have looked at that before I came up. I'll make sure I figure that out before the next service comes around. But he was born in 1919. So Balto was a sled dog. Sled dogs have a unique set of gifts. They're bred way up north where it's really cold. So they have a layer of fat that covers their muscles that helps to keep them warm. But they also have two coats. They have two fur coats. They have a really small fur coat that's really close to their skin, so you can't see it very well. Then they have a really thick, kind of a shaggy fur coat, and that's the one that you see, right? But those coats together with the fat that they have inside helps them to stay really, really warm. It's a really special set of gifts. So sled dogs, and the only reason that I know this is because I love dogs. I have a dog named Gus. You've heard me talk about Gus. But I used to have Malamutes and Huskies, and I absolutely loved them. I still do. Learned as much about them as I could, which is where I learned about those coats. I found out when I was learning about them that Huskies and Malamutes are unique dogs because they're most comfortable when the temperature is between negative 20 and negative 40 outside. And they can survive up to negative 60 outside. Can you, that's really cold. Have you ever been in weather that, that, that's that cold? Man, that's where it doesn't get that cold here in Oklahoma, does it? Thank goodness, I don't think so. Well, Balto was one of those dogs. So he was uniquely gifted for exactly where he lived. Well, in 1925, there was a terrible outbreak of a terrible disease in Nome, Alaska, which is way far north in Alaska. Alaska is a huge state. And they they didn't have any way to get the medicine up there to the people who needed the medicine. And if they didn't get the medicine there, those people were going to die. So they had a plane, and they thought maybe they could fly this plane from Anchorage up to Nome. And that's a pretty good distance. That's really pretty far. But the engine on the airplane froze, and they had no idea what to do. So somebody came up with an idea that they could use a train to get the the medicine as far as they could. And then from from that point on, they would use dog sled teams to take the medicine all the way up to Nome, Alaska. And so they did. They put the medicine on a train. They took the train as far north as they could. And then when it stopped, they had dog sled teams that met them. They took the medicine, and they mushed through a blizzard. It was a terrible blizzard, and it took them a very long time. There were 20 different dog sled teams that ran this medicine up to Nome, Alaska. The temperatures were terrible. It was negative 30 outside. There was a terrible blizzard covering most of the state. So the snow was blowing so hard that the the dog handlers who ride the sled, most of them couldn't even see their hands in front of their faces. So do you know what that meant? They had to rely on the dogs to make sure that they found the right way. The last dog sled team was led by a sled dog named Balto. He ran 55 miles into the middle of the night through a blizzard in temperatures that were negative 30 degrees outside. He even saved his sled team from falling into a river in the middle of the night. But the blizzard got so bad that his handler had no idea 
where he was going, and Balto had to find a way, and he did. He came in to the right place early in the morning at about 2 o'clock in the morning. They got the medicine delivered and saved countless lives, all because Balto did what Balto was gifted to do. So there's been a movie, um, movie made about him. There's a cartoon movie that's been made about him, which may be where you know his name from. Yep, I thought maybe so. And there's a statue of Balto in Central Park in New York because of this great thing that he did. Here's what I want you to remember. Just like Balto, Balto was uniquely gifted for that mission. He was made to live in that weather. He was made to find the trail and stay on the trail and to keep his team and his handler safe. Other dogs couldn't do that. I had a basset hound for a long time. Do you know what a basset hound is? They're about this long and they're about this tall, and they're little hound dogs. They smell things really well, they're super cute, but they're not gonna pull a sled anywhere, much less in the snow. When my basset hound went out in the snow, I used to watch her kind of jump up and down through the snow trying to make a way for herself. But Balto was gifted for just that environment, for exactly that mission. So I want you to remember this. God has a very specific calling for you in mind, and God is even now uniquely gifting you for the calling that God wants to place on your life. And when the time comes and God reveals what that calling is, you'll be uniquely gifted and prepared by the Holy Spirit to live that out because that's how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. So when you're faced with a task that seems immeasurably difficult, that seems so hard, but something in your spirit says, no, this is what the Holy Spirit gifted me to do, I want you to know that we're all praying for you and we'll be upholding you in prayer as the Spirit works in you. All right, let's pray together. And at the end of the prayer, I'm going to say, and all the people said, and I want you to join me and say amen. Would you do that? Let's pray. God, we're so very grateful that you gift us in special ways to live out the calling that you've placed on our lives. We're grateful, God, for stories like the story of Balto, for his courage and his unwavering loyalty in the face of the very kind of hardship that he was created to step into. We pray, God, that you would be with us, help us to realize what our gifting is and help us to respond to your call so that we can put your gifts to work at the right time. And all the people said, thank you for coming up this morning. I think Ms. Schultz is ready to take you to Children's Church. If you know Tom Osborne, then you know that name because Tom Osborne was a well-beloved coach in Nebraska. Now, you may have hated Tom Osborne from the 1970s through the late 1990s because Nebraska was such a powerhouse football team during that time, largely because of Tom Osborne and the work he did uh, at the University of Nebraska. Kate and I lived in Lincoln, Nebraska for a few years. Uh, we, we were uh, moved there by a company that she was working for at the time, and I found a job working in Indian education for Lincoln Public Schools. We decided one day, we'd purchased a house in suburban uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, and we decided one day, because we were not Nebraska fans, we've never been Nebraska fans, and so it was a Saturday, and Nebraska was playing a football game at home, and we thought, now nah, we're just going to go uh, see a movie. So we looked and we found a movie. It was playing downtown, which is not super far from the stadium. Little did we know that on game day, the stadium in the University of Nebraska Stadium at Lincoln becomes the third largest city in the state of Nebraska. And that's true. That's not an exaggeration. So we went down there and could not find a place to park anywhere. And this was even after the Tom Osborne era. Tom Osborne was a great coach. He, took, he did wonderful things at Nebraska, won 255 games throughout the course of his career as a coach, only losing 53 games throughout the entire time that he served as a coach. Great winning record, uh, great legacy at the University of Nebraska. But I'm going to guess that it is his legacy in the state of Nebraska and in four of the states surrounding Nebraska that you're probably least familiar with. In the late 1990s, Tom and his wife, Nancy, decided that they could make a larger impact 
uh, throughout the state of Nebraska, but specifically right there in Lincoln than they were making because they found out that there were a lot of students in, Link in the Lincoln public school system who were not graduating from high school. Many of them uh, were certainly not going on to college. Many of them were not attending classes frequently. Many of them were running into obstacle after obstacle after obstacle that kept them from attending classes. And Tom and Nancy started looking into this situation thinking, we can do something about this. So Tom took 22 of his players... 22 of his players on the team, University of Nebraska football team, who were also outstanding academic performers, and he created a community service requirement that prior to the late 90s, that football team did not have. He said, you're going to have to get X number of community service hours, and oh, by the way, I have an idea about how you can accomplish this. He went and partnered with the Lincoln Public School District to create a program called Teammates, where he would partner his football players with students at that time from middle schools throughout the, the Lincoln area and Lincoln Public Schools, and they would mentor these students. For one hour, one day a week, a football player would be matched up with a middle school student. Now, if you can imagine, most of the middle school students who were huge fans of Nebraska football were so excited when the football team would come in to work with them as mentors because they would come in wearing their game day jerseys and they would get a huge fanfare when they walked into the school. And they would take the student, they would pull them out of class and take them into the library for some one-on-one -on -one time. They'd read together. They'd work on homework together. They'd do a little bit of tutoring if the tutoring was necessary. The program was so successful in that first year with middle school students that Tom decided that he would expand that and try to move it beyond his football team and beyond the middle schools in Lincoln, Nebraska. Now, if you don't work in education, then the, the term achievement gap is probably unfamiliar to you. The achievement gap usually describes the disparity between those who graduate from high school and those who do not. In particular, that's often identified along ethnic lines. So there is a huge disparity. There is a huge achievement gap between people of a, a Caucasian ancestry and people of an Asian ancestry and those of a Hispanic or Latino and African American ancestry that was uh, predominant in the state of Lincoln, but it runs throughout the country. Those who have uh, an ethnic background that is primarily Caucasian or Asian tend to graduate high school in much higher numbers than those who have an ethnic background that is predominantly African American or Hispanic. And so Tom, aware of these statistics, aware of the achievement gap, the achievement gap began to wonder if this program might be successful outside of the middle schools. All oh, the middle school kids were loving it, right? They were showing up to class more frequently. They were doing better in class, turning in assignments, doing better on tests. And Tom and his wife thought, if this is working here, maybe it'll work in the high schools as well. Maybe we can increase graduation rates. Maybe if God is really with us, I heard Tom speak about this the very first time at Christ United Methodist Church in downtown Lincoln, Nebraska, when Kate and I were living there. And by this point, the program had been up and running for quite some time, and they thought if God is, if the Holy Spirit is really working in this, maybe we won't just raise education rates, maybe we'll raise rates of attendance to college post-graduation from high school. So they expanded the program. They brought in more football players. They began a training program, and in a partnership with Lincoln Public Schools, started training adult members of the Lincoln community to mentor students in high schools, in middle schools, and in elementary schools. And they started saying things like this, because mentoring was not new, it was just new in Lincoln. Mentoring has been around for a long time. So there are statistics aplenty to back up the idea that the longer your relationship with a student whom you mentor, the more likely that student is to be successful. Meaning, the more likely that student is to regularly attend classes 
and miss less frequently. More likely that, a stu that student is to have a higher grade point average. The more likely those students are to graduate from high school, and the more likely those students are to go on to college. And so parents, people in the Lincoln community started mentoring students as early as the fourth grade, some of them staying with students all the way through graduation from high school. Last year, the teammates mentoring program that Tom and his wife Nancy began in the late 90s mentored 10,000 students, not total, just last year, 10,500 students in five states around Nebraska. They gave out last year $3.1 million in college scholarships. And they have a tremendous track record. At the end of, of every school year, particularly in Lincoln, where this program began, there is a banquet. And there's, that banquet is specifically for students who are graduating, their families, and their mentors. I attended one of those banquets one year, and I had the chance to listen to a young girl. She was a part of the Omaha tribe up in that part of the country. Uh, the, the predominant Native American tribes are the Omaha Nation and the Ponca Nation, and then a little further north, uh, various elements of the Dakota Nation. But this, this girl had grown up a member of the Omaha tribe, and she got up to give a speech. And she talked about her mentor. It was a, a man who looked a lot like me. He must have had a lot more hair when he started mentoring her than he did by this point in her academic career because she said uh, this guy started mentoring her in the, when she was in the fourth grade. And every, every week, once a week for an hour, he would come to school. He'd pull her out. They'd go into the library. He'd bring a lunch, and they'd eat lunch together. And they did all kinds of things. They read. They did homework. He tutored her, helped her through difficult subjects, and that lasted all the way through her high school years. It was in her sophomore year of high school when he encouraged her to take the ACT, and when he encouraged her to take the SAT and to retake it because she had no idea that she would be able to go to college. And yet she stood there that day to tell us about the full scholarship that she had earned, academic scholarship, to the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. 10,500 students last year, $3.1 million in scholarships. Countless lives changed because one football coach took a look at the brokenness in his community and said, God, you have uniquely prepared my family to step into this mission field. As we're working our way through the kingdom statements of Christ today, I want to tell you just a little bit about what the mission of the kingdom is and how we step into that, how we discover our mission, and how we step into living a life in mission together with what the Holy Spirit is doing in the kingdom. Your mission is different from your purpose. And that missional language, I know, is unique to the church. So when I say mission, think calling. Your calling is different than your purpose. Genesis makes our purpose clear. Your purpose, the purpose for which you were created by God, was to have fellowship with God. Genesis is incredibly clear about that. Your purpose is the same as my purpose, which is the same as the purpose of the purpose, uh, person sitting next to you and every person you will encounter. Our purpose is to live life in fellowship with God. But there is a difference between your purpose and your calling. There is a difference between your purpose and your mission. Your mission is to participate in the redemptive work of the Spirit. The Spirit is at work finding the lost, healing the broken, and resurrecting the dead. That is the, the redemptive work that the Spirit is doing in the world. We've talked so many times about how we live in a world that is broken. Genesis tells us that story too, that at the beginning of all things, there was a time when the world broke, and we've been living in the midst of that brokenness. Humanity was an integral part of that breaking process. We've been living in the midst of that brokenness ever since, or more appropriately, We've been living in the midst of God's great cosmic plan of redemption ever since the world broke. So we live in a world that's broken. 
we know that there's a time that will come when the final consummation of all things will happen. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. Revelation tells us that at that time, we will want for nothing. There will be no more pain. There will be no more tears. There will be no more loss. We'll be living in eternity together with God in a new kingdom that comes down, a new Jerusalem. There will be a new heaven and there will be a new earth. And we won't have to worry about things like death anymore. But in the meantime, We live in the midst of the brokenness into which the kingdom is breaking. The kingdom, as we've talked about, does that because of Jesus Christ. What Christ did, what God did in Christ at the crucifixion and the resurrection and through the ascension brings an inbreaking of the kingdom into the brokenness of the world. So what do we do? We are called in the midst of this time in between times to step into the mission of the Spirit, to step into the mission of the kingdom, which is to redeem brokenness. The, the kingdom is at work breaking into the brokenness of the earth, redeeming that brokenness even now. That's why so many of you are here, because the kingdom has already broken into your lives and is working and has worked the Holy Spirit's work of redemption. The kingdom is at work breaking into the brokenness of the world, bringing redemption, finding the lost. I like the way that's said, and I like the image that's all, that we always associate with that in the Christian community, because it is an always an image of Jesus as shepherd going to find the one sheep who wandered away from the flock. And so when uh, often you'll see a painting of Jesus that carrying that lost sheep on his shoulders, going back to the rest of the flock. Why do I like that? Because it's an image of actively finding the lost. It's an image that that we're called to step into. Oh, yes, uh, pastor, isn't it Jesus who goes and finds the lost? Yes, we're called to step into that mission. We're called to follow Christ as Christ is actively stepping out to go and find the lost where they are. Why do I like that? Because there's a big difference between yelling at the lost to let them know where we are and going to find them. I heard a story once, and it was a bit of an extrapolation about that imagery where Jesus is going to find the lost, and the minister telling this story said, what if Jesus, who's going to find that one sheep, didn't go and find that one sheep? What if instead, Jesus put up some big signs and used a megaphone to let the sheep know where Jesus was? Don't worry, we're here, it's safe here, come to where we are. Had Jesus not gone to find that sheep, Jesus may not have ever seen that that jeep was standing on a ledge off the side of a cliff where it could not have any hope of getting back up on its own. We have to go and find the lost. My guess is that in your own redemption story, your story includes a story of how you were actively sought out and found by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to find the lost. The Holy Spirit is healing the broken. We live in a broken world, and therefore it stands to reason that we're going to deal with brokenness, and there is plenty of it. So much of it, in fact, that it boggles our minds. Why is it that God allows these things to happen? If God has it within God's power to heal everyone and to make everyone okay all the time, why isn't God doing that? Well, the answer to that question is not best given in someone's time of heartache and tragedy because the answer to that question rests in an understanding of the story of Genesis. We live in a broken world. That will change, but in the meantime, we're going to die. We're going to deal with brokenness. We're going to deal with suffering because we live in a world that is broken. But even in the midst of that brokenness, the Holy Spirit is working now to bring healing to those who are broken. The first part of that healing happens when you are the sheep stuck on the side of a cliff. And all of a sudden you realize that you're not alone. And that this predicament that you're in, whatever it is that caused you to get there, if you've heard me teach, you've heard me say something like this. Oftentimes, we end up in predicaments like that. So just with that metaphor of the sheep stuck on an outcropping on the side of a cliff, can't get back up on its own. If we're going to use that metaphor, then I would say something like, sometimes we end up there of our own accord. Because sometimes we make terrible choices. I've told many of you about one of my favorite church signs that says everything happens for a reason. We don't believe in fate in the United Methodist Church. We believe in free will. I still love the sign. It says everything happens for a reason. Sometimes the reason is you're stupid and make bad choices. I think that's hilarious, right? 
Sometimes we make terrible choices that cause us to end up where we are. Other times, life circumstances, the brokenness of the world conspires to bring us to that place. I can tell you that I've dealt with a series of circumstances before that I had absolutely nothing to do with. And yet they happened anyway, and I had to figure out how to get through them and overcome them. Sometimes life circumstances conspire with our own stupid decisions to bring us into a place that we have no hope of getting out of on our own. And that first opportunity for healing happens in the moment when we look up and realize that not only do we not have to get out of this on our own, but the one who can get us out of this, the one who can bring us back to wholeness, the one who can bring us back to the safety of the community of the kingdom has been looking for us and found us. The the, the kingdom is at work. The spirit is at work finding the lost, healing the broken, resurrecting the dead. Around this time of year, I think it's worth considering that there are probably relationships in your life that could stand to be resurrected. Pastor, I don't know if I can reconcile with this person. This person has done something that I don't know if I can let go of. I don't know. I mean, I can forgive them, but I don't know that I can forgive them. And yet, that's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness means that we don't require the just compensation that we should deserve because of what happened. This time of year, I think it's worth thinking about relationships that can be resurrected. But pastor, if I forgive them, that doesn't mean they're going to forgive me. No, but you're only responsible for what God is calling you to do. And you and I serve a God who is well-skilled at breathing new life into things that appeared to be lifeless. The Spirit is at work even now, resurrecting the dead. The Spirit is at work even now, resurrecting the parts of your life and the relationships in your life and the opportunities that you don't believe have any life in them anymore. That's what the Spirit is doing. The mission of the kingdom is the mission of resurrecting and redeeming the lost and the broken. You are uniquely gifted to step into the brokenness that your experience has equipped you to see. Everyone around you won't see brokenness in the same place. Your mission, your mission will be defined by how you see brokenness in the world, and you'll see brokenness based on how your experiences have uniquely equipped you to see that brokenness and its prevalence in the world. There's brokenness everywhere. And if you're not careful, you can easily be overwhelmed by all that needs to be done in the world. The good news of God and Jesus Christ is that while the kingdom is breaking in, the kingdom is breaking in everywhere, and God is capable of doing far more than you can ever do. And yet God has a purpose and a mission for you. Your mission will be defined by how you see brokenness in the world. You are uniquely gifted to step into that brokenness. Your mission, like Tom's, will be defined by where you see that brokenness. And when you see it, two things will happen. You'll begin to realize that God has uh, uniquely combined the gifts given to you by the Holy Spirit with the experiences in your life to prepare you to step into that mission field. You'll also begin to realize that everyone else around you, while they think this mission is important, doesn't think it's as important as you do, and you won't understand why. The answer to that question is, that the Spirit has also uniquely gifted them to step into the brokenness that their experience has allowed them to see because the Spirit is doing more than one act of redemption in the brokenness of the world right now. That doesn't lessen the importance of what the Spirit is calling you to. I don't know if the Spirit will call you to step into a mentoring program. If you have a chance to watch the second service today, that's an expanded message, and I'll be telling three stories about opportunities that you have, that we have, to step into what God is doing to redeem brokenness in the world. Maybe mentoring is that for you. We have that opportunity here. 
My suspicion, however, is that the Holy Spirit has already caused you to open your eyes to a kind of brokenness that you are uniquely gifted to step into. The mission of the kingdom is different than the purpose for which we were created. God created you to have fellowship with you. But God's calling on your life will be to lead you into participating in finding the lost, healing the broken, and resurrecting the dead. The Holy Spirit will call you to participate in what the Holy Spirit is doing to accomplish those things in the places where you actively see the brokenness of the world. Would you pray with me? Gracious and giving God, we are so very grateful for the inspiring stories of redemption that come from those people throughout the ages who have followed your calling. Those people who have stepped into the mission that you've given them to be a part of how you are redeeming brokenness in the world. We pray, God, that for those of us who are wondering, that you would identify for us at the right time what the gifts are that you've given us, the unique ways in which you've gifted us to step into the brokenness that we see. We pray, God, that you would open our eyes and help us to realize that we're seeing the brokenness that we see in the world for a reason. Help us to understand that it's you that's guiding us toward how we can participate in the redemptive work of your Holy Spirit. This we ask in your holy name. Amen. Please stand for the affirmation of faith. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray together for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and re reveal your glory in the world, Lord, in your mercy. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good, Lord, in your mercy. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others, and to your honor and glory, Lord, in your mercy. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours, and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as Christ loves us, Lord, in your mercy. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation, Lord, in your mercy. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom, Lord, in your mercy. We offer these prayers through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Mighty and merciful God, you know the thoughts of our hearts. We confess that we have sinned against you and done evil in your sight. We have transgressed your holy laws. We have disregarded your word and sacraments. Forgive us, O Lord. Give us grace and power to put away all hurtful things, that being delivered from the bondage of sin, we may bring forth fruit worthy of repentance, and from henceforth may ever walk in your holy ways through Jesus Christ our Lord. I invite you to offer prayers of confession in silence. We confess our sins. God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May the Almighty and merciful Lord grant us remission of all our sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As a forgiven and reconciled people, let us offer ourselves and our gifts to the Lord. of abundant blessing, may our gifts become instruments of your truth and vessels of your love. May our offerings plant seeds of hope wherever they are planted. May these gifts build a world of justice and righteousness for all. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Immediately after the second service today, we'll be having our annual tailgate party in the CLC. I want to invite you to come. If you want to bring a tailgate dish, that would be great. I think there are prizes for those, uh, but we would love just to have you there to join us. So even if you did not think of that or know about it, come and join us anyway. We're going to have a great time. Next week is our fall festival on Sunday afternoon, uh, and we're also working right now to tally up who has sold the most pumpkins in the pumpkin patch. The winner of that tally will earn an award at the Thanksgiving dinner that the youth put on later in November. Uh, so get out there and sell a bunch of pumpkins uh, so that we can make sure that you're in the running for that award coming up later on uh, in November. All right, so all throughout November, we're going to participate in a toy drive. We have some members of our church who are actively working to be able to offer um, a free shopping opportunity for some of, some of the families here in and around Southern Hills to be able to get Christmas toys for their children this Christmas. We've been collecting toys all year. That's what the chest in the narthex is for. But we're going to have a toy drive all through the month of November, very much like our food drive that we do in the summer. So bring toys as you can for, for uh, boys or girls. All throughout the month of November, we will place those up here on the uh, communion rails here in the sanctuary so that we can help to support that effort. The last thing I want to share with you is that we will no longer be collecting funds to support the Reverend Kristen Brown, who has been our missionary in the Holy Land. And the reason that we will not be doing that is because she has come back to the United States. She's asked for an appointment here in the Oklahoma Annual Conference, and so as of right now, she is in her hometown of Tahlequah, waiting to hear from the bishop about which church she will be appointed to. Uh, so I know that she is grateful for the funds that have been collected over the years, but there is no reason to continue to collect them for her. She'll be serving a church in the very near future. Would you receive a blessing from me? Continue in what you've learned and firmly believed. Hold fast to the sacred writings that are able to instruct you in the ways of salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Go forth to proclaim the message you have heard. Go forth to be the people of God. Amen.